been live streamed. Al, did you see that? How yeah, very that was the plan. Oh, I think good. it worked. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. <laughs> so advanced, Nick. So advanced. I know. I do. Okay. Hi everyone, uh, good evening and welcome to our third webinar series, Applying Skill Acquisition in Different Domains. Uh, Movement and Skill Acquisition Ireland is comprised of Edward Collin, Phil Kearney, Ali Logan and myself, Alan Dunton, and we are passionate about skill acquisition, coaching science and youth development. Uh, and we hope by hosting these webinars, we are able to connect you with some of the leading figures in these respective areas. Our previous two webinars, which ran back in 2020, uh, are on YouTube, and you can check those out on our YouTube channel, MSA Ireland. For those of you in the webinar, uh, if you could just please keep yourselves on mute as we go through it. And if you have questions, you can pop those in the chat box, and we will come to you towards the end of the presentation section, and you can ask your uh, questions directly to our speakers today. And for those of you on YouTube, you can also pop your questions into those comment boxes, and we'll try and get to you as well. Um, and without further ado on that, I'm going to hand you over to Ed and he is going to introduce you to our speakers for today. Thank you, Al. Uh, great to see everybody and love to see some familiar names there as well. And, uh, and as Alan said, welcome to episode three of series three. Uh, huge privilege tonight to introduce our two guests. Um, and I'll cut straight into it with uh, I've been I was heard heard about uh, psychological safety for a number of years. It was it has been wheeling ar around the domain of coaching science for for a long time. But it was not until I met uh, Nick Levette that I actually saw it in practice. And Nick is one of our guests tonight. He's currently the head of UK coaching and head of coaching at UK coaching and also as a former head of coaching with the FA. And what I mean by. What, I, what it looks like in, in practice is the environment that Nick creates and even his engagement with people. And I know I, I go back to a conversation Nick and I had when he asked me would I get involved with some, um, some con, you know, chats about the development of a new coaching framework. It was completely and utterly embedded in a real sense of everyone's welcome. All their voices is welcome. Your, your discussion is, your, your contribution will be welcome in, in whatever way you choose to do it. And you will be heard and you will feel like you're a part of something because of that safe environment for, where people feel like they can chat and challenge. But so long as it's done in a respectful way, we will get work done and it will be engaged with. So if, great opportunity to have Nick come on and talk to us about his experience in the coaching space at the very highest level of coach education, but also to be joined by, by Jenny Coe, who I, I also said recently in, in, a, in a social media post, someone who lives the idea of psychological safety. Um, I've recently been engaged with Jenny with the, her, her book, which we have here, in fact, shameless plug, uh, the myths of sports coaching that herself and Amy Whitehead have put together as co-editors. But again, the engagement that, that both Jenny and uh, Amy put forward was one of sharing. Come and talk to us about what it is that you do, and we will help get your voice out to others. And again, it's so important because even the work that if anyone follows Jenny's work, you'll, you'll get a deep appreciation that what's more important than anything else is, is enabling people to strive in their environment, that to create a place where everybody can contribute equally. I will direct you towards a discussion that uh, Jenny had along with Amy on uh, Dan Abraham's podcast, the, sport, the, the Sports Psych Show, where you will come across some of the most articulate uh, discussion around, first of all, the myths of sports coaching, but also just what the experiences that coaches will come across during their careers. And you, uh, you were, you're probably going to hear a lot of that concise, succinct articulation in what we're going to hear tonight, because these two guests that we have are uh, at the top of their game. So without further ado, uh, welcome Jenny and welcome Nick. And I, we, we, what we're going to hopefully hear from you tonight is uh, almost a, a bird's eye view or a fly in the wall of your coaches' conversations that you guys have on a regular basis. And tonight we'd like you to maybe have one of those conversations in line with what skill acquisition means to you guys and, and in that space of the development of young players but also as it progresses through to, let's say, the high performance end of sport. So welcome, Jenny, and welcome, Nick. 
Why? Thanks for having us. How exciting. Um, well, so you I've mentioned... Got, I've yeah, got three on. problems, though, right from the start. <laughs> yes. See, this is how it runs. You talk about flying the wall. We're in. Great. Right. right. So, so here's the first problem, uh, Ed. Right. Neither Jenny nor I are concise. We, no. will, <laughs> uh, we will waffle, ramble, and there will be all sorts of random things. Um, uh, and what generally when we have a coach conversation discussion right we'll say right let's talk about this today we never talk about what we think we're going to talk about we just go off a massive tangent so we're never concise um i don't know if it is that a privilege who knows and leading figure i don't know what that really means so um that was my three questions from the start but yeah we'll see well, if I can answer the leading figure one, uh, your name comes up a lot. And I often find t- people's names come up a lot for two reasons. Either one, they're creating unnecessary noise or what they say is, is something that needs to be heard. And I think you're in the latter. I think a lot of the, con- the, the, the content that you would share on social media, but also the content you share through UK coaching and, and help generate through UK coaching is some of is some of the best coach education content on the planet right now. And I think that's, that's an important thing to state because anyone that I know that has subscribed to the UK coaching um, hub have come back with, this is an incredible resource and, and also so accessible. The, the, the manner with which you and your team disseminate coaching science and sports science research from experts in the field, from you know, reflective practice with Brendan Cropley, the Think Aloud protocols from Amy Whitehead, and so on, many, many others, is why I think you're a leading voice and a part of a team that that are leading the way in coaching science. That's why. Well, well that quiet. didn't put you in your place, Nick. There you go. Right. <laughs> Be quiet now. <laughs> so, um, for people who haven't seen Coach Conversation, the it emulates kind of a coaching process in a way we sit down we think about we arrange you know a time we sit down and we plan what we might talk about and then we go off piste if we need to and and that's the flexibility that we'd have and we review either together in a quick hot debrief or afterwards and then we'll do some editing which informs the next session and stuff like that so that little plan do review um but not being afraid to go off uh, it's living we're living breathing that outside the coaching space um they also function we brought in in season three the, the twitter feed because people are functioning a lot through social media tiktok platforms and stuff like this so um nick does uh, i am definitely um twitter is an extension of my hand but nick does post incredible stuff and they give us great um real life examples which i think sometimes people go to courses and they join in webinars which are fantastic but the how part is missing they listen for a large portion of time and they go away and they think oh yeah this psych safety term um this deliberate practice term this and they have all these terms in a big bag of them and they either don't know how to to break them down share them or they're in an environment that's really static and they can't actually go back and say, hey, hey, you 10 people. Well, I don't know what privileged people are with 10 people around them. Hey, my assistant coach, let's talk about this, you know, when they're doing one hour or three hours a week. So um, there's lots of tweet, uh, tweets that we can get into. But I think, Nick, you posted one today. That would be a good start. Yeah, it's, it's my Twitter feed is generally a slightly softened version of what's really going on in my head. Um, <laughs> God. Because if I said that, I'd probably get sacked. Um, yeah, generally, it's just stuff that's bugged me in the coaching world. That I just think, like, why? And it's just my view of the world, right? Like, I have no monopoly over that view. I just have a view. And so so today, I was um, sorting out my son's football fixture for the weekend. Um, and... I coach the under eight football team and uh, I got a message from the manager. So I just do the coaching, which is brilliant. So I don't do any of the admin. Um, I would thoroughly recommend that, by the way, just coach the kids and get somebody else to do the admin. So I don't deal with organizing fixtures, parents, managers. I, I get the get a message to say um, uh, none of none of his development players are available this weekend. This was from the opposition manager. And I was like, what's a development player? Like, surely that's every kid. 
And, and I can, uh, we played a team not so long, like I'm off now, Ed, you've started it. Like, um, uh, we played a team not so long ago and I, and they were way better than us. Like, we're not very good. We're below average. And, um, and, and I said to him, you know, well, like, I know you've got two teams and I know they stream by ability, which is a, a big debate we might touch upon later on. Um, yeah. and, and I said, look, like, we're not very, we're not very good. Why don't we try and find, the, you know, the right level of pitch? And he said, yeah, he said, our development team are, uh, are not available this weekend. I'm like, well, surely that's both teams. Like, when do you stop being a development team? Because I would probably argue every professional football team, Premier League team, every sports team, you're still a development team because the aspiration is to get better and improve at what you do. So, and so then label a kid and go, oh, well, yeah, you know, you're a development player. I'm like, oh, what's that mean? Like, yeah so, uh, that was it but where does that come from then like what where do you think it, for, like trying to understand say from a coach's perspective is that a label that he's just taken and run r- ran with for ages and going you know it's easy if i if i put people in boxes and labels then i can accept that i'm d- getting a person from a to b and i can manage the parents and if they're lucky enough to have a development plan because they're a development player like who, who's kind of perpetuating all this stuff do you think and does he not have any support maybe is someone not like giving a little check and challenge on well i mean your feedback initially like he could watch this this would be helpful. yeah he better not watch this i've been told <laughs> uh I, where i think it's come from is i think i think coaches don't want to call kids crap so I don't want to go, you're crap, you're not crap. You're rubbish, you're not rubbish. So to, to avoid labelling kids in that way, they'll go, well, let's call them a development player. Like, just, just say that they're a kid. Uh, you know, they're a person. They're a, they're a player. Mm-hmm. Like, just they are who they are. As a, like, name them. Yeah. Like, don't even, don't say that you're a development player. Oh, yeah, Sam and whoever, like, this is you. Or, like... And I, and I think it's because coaches don't want to say that they're not very good, so they, they call them a development player. But I'm not even sure that term's right. So just, yeah, yeah that's where I think it's come from. But it, it's morphed from that, is my guess. So, OK, if we look at, without drowning this topic, um, I know we spoke earlier in the week about there, last week about this, there's 11 million young people playing football in the country, 3.5 of those are girls. There's... Uh, just under a million young people under the age of 16 playing basketball in Britain, in the UK. 500 of them go on their 11 to 15 Aspire programme. 80 of them go into a talent, which is the 13 to 14. 300 go into a development pool of 16 to 19. And then they have an opportunity to get picked on a national team. But like, look at the shrinkage there. Now, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I'm saying if, if you're in a sport, there's one issue that we have, which isn't for tonight, about these glossy, brilliant pathways and brilliant um, magazines or, or document strategies that are produced. And actually, when you get down to the grassroots or the early uh, selection stages or, or when the academies are introduced, what they actually look like there and how, what, you know, how the coaches are understanding that is, is really different. But obviously, you know, knowing basketball in the country and having worked with them, I was interested to see what that looked like and where that path kind of goes and do people actually know what the entry and exit points are or if you don't make that aspire 500 at some stage or you don't make your school team is it this kind of cross off because we have we have a job to do here as a coach you know tick box get you in a profile you're this age or this height Ooh, you're on the team I mean I played basketball in Ireland for years and it was it was a joke it was a joke but it's not a very funny joke but it was definitely a joke around anyone who was any way over six foot was just it was like binoculars from afar or like a safe sniper kind of person who is she she's in mayo get her on the national team quickly i don't know what's happening there's a six foot four down in kerry will we get her on can she play i don't know she's farming at the moment right get her on the team you know and all of a sudden you had a girl who you know really big talk because we'd go to europe and you just wouldn't be able to match the height that was there so they thought instead of building the team of what we have and the people who are in in that space we'll just go and head on now going slightly off but looking at the volume of people who are playing and how detrimental it could be to start pocketing people off um and then obviously from a coach development point of view i'd question the level of experience that the coach has the support that they have to be able to make these life-changing decisions on behalf of players you know can can i ask a question so about this because we, we see it everywhere and the, the clubs that I'm involved in, 
albeit I'm there as a, as a volunteer coach, parent, like, like everybody else, my, my, my other coaching happens elsewhere, but here I'm a volunteer coach. At, at about 10 years of age, 10, under 10s, under 11s, we begin that streaming process of the good, the not so good, and the runts of the litter, let's say. At, at what stage would you guys be thinking we should hold off on that until? Because right, right now it's happening, certainly in soccer in Ireland, football that you, that you might call it, Nick, it's happening here in Ireland as at, at under 10s. That's when be, the, the streaming begins. And then what we also know from the evidence, it's really hard. If, you, if you've been labeled a C by, at that stage, it is all but a miracle if you ever find yourself in the higher grade in your adolescence time because of the biases that kick in so, so, so quickly and the self-fulfilling prophecy of these coaches. So at what stage would, we, if, we, if we had a silver bullet to be able to say, actually, Overnight, we can change it, and all clubs and sports will say we will not stream the players until this age. What age would you say that should be, ideally? Go on, Jim. So my gut feeling was, or my uh, my emotional reaction to that was, how sad. I mean, listen, it is here in the foundation at West Ham, um, it's under tens, and they go younger for kind of a broader participation angle, but into your teams at ten. Um, Without kind of generalizing all the sports, I would be going into the teens. I would be in the 14, 15. Um, and I know there'll be gasps from people going, what? How can we how can we impart all of our knowledge at that stage when, you know, there's a cost page and they might leave and all this. But to think at 10 that we are just pocketing people off. Um, I know rugby years and years ago, when we were speaking to Des Ryan about it, looking at changing the, the the way we were selecting the age groups and the importance, like the important level um, of that specialization into the certain categories. And then you are launch padded into, you know, a senior trajectory, but it would be for me in around that 14, 15. And remember now, when you say 10, I'm talking under 10. So it's yes, nine. Nine. yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. And you have a seven year old who's playing up under 10. Yeah. 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 That's um, yeah, that that is interesting. But again, like like again, if I may ask you, Nick, from your time in the FA, where again at the elite level, we are we're we're told we're led to believe at the elite level, oh, it's better get them playing with better players. And yet, the statistics of those guys having gone through that so-called elite level academy structure, so many of them don't make it out the other end, and the fall off and the the fallout of that from a psychological perspective and that feeling of failure, even though they're only 19 or 20 and they have the entire rest of their lives to make. Any comment around that from what you would have seen on the front line? In that yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I, I had a bit of a, a soapbox moment about this as well last week. So educational research about streaming kids, when you look at John Hattie's work, and he's a pretty... Um, well thought of researcher in this space in an educational perspective the impact on attainment in schools so how well kids do is not influenced by putting them in a top set a middle set a bottom set a grouping by ability grouping by ability does not have a major impact on their attainment right and I, and I appreciate that is an educational setting which is different to a a physical, complex, dynamic decision-making environment like a sports setting. So it might be different. And I use that word there. It might be different. But that evidence says it's not. But we just do it. And no one's ever challenged it. We just say, let's let's stream and buy ability. Now, when I first started at the FA, one of the first things I had to do, I looked at the rules. And if you had more than one team in an age group, you had to clearly distinguish between the teams, who was the A team, the B team, the C team, the D team. Now, it isn't going to do much for your self-esteem when someone says, Jenny, you're not very good, you're in the F team. And you, like, I mean, where's the incentive to think, oh my God, I'm going to do really well at this game, I'm going to fall in love with it, when someone goes, look, you're in the F team, you might get into the E team, if there's a couple of injuries and Ed's at a party next week and Phil can't make it because he's Nan's birthday. Like that might be the only way you get in there. So the first thing I did was scrap all of that and get rid of that. Nobody wants to be labeled in that kind of way. Now I think we, because everything exists within 
a, a culture and environment and often rules. So in my opinion, I'm with Jen, I, I probably wouldn't start putting them into streaming abilities properly until you start to know what's going on from a physical maturation perspective, because it's going to influence stuff. You're going to end up with all sorts of different people by the end of it, right? However, however, and this is my caveat, right? I think you should stream at under seven, once or twice a season. But I also think once or twice a season, kids could play 11 v 11 on a full-size pitch. <laughs> once or twice a season. Now, the problem is, is when we do that every week, we know that's not good. But in my opinion, the best thing for kids is variety, is a diet that isn't one size fits all. Like my son would have pizza every day if he could. But at some stage, we've got to realise that's not just good for him. I would still have pizza every day. But he is probably not good for him in a, in a balanced diet. So for me, the overwhelming bit should be mix them up, play with different kids. But we exist in a rule structure. And I'm guessing your kids' teams that, that you coach, Ed, sit within a league. Mm -hmm. And that league is run by administrators who are volunteers, who have a set of rules that are prescribed by the federation or the leading sport body, whatever sport you might be, that says you can only register this amount of kids. You can't move kids by team. Because the logical thing that would be awesome would be right this week or for the next four weeks, you lot are playing together. And then after four weeks, we're going to shift a couple of you so you can play in this group and a couple of you so you go up into that group. And then you're going to play with some different kids here. But then you go back to what the motivation is about why kids play football or why kids do whatever sport they're doing. So the overwhelming motivation about why kids play sport is because they want to be with their mates, they want to make new friends, and because they love playing the game. It isn't about winning trophies and medals and league competitions. That doesn't kick in until later on when you start to get a bit of an extrinsic motivating driver. So if their values about why they play are intrinsic ones about being with their mates and making new friends, put them in teams and move them about so they can be with their mates. Why should then Jenny get split up from playing with Ed just because Jenny's really good and Ed is, is not so good? But if they want to play together, let them play together. So it, it, it's difficult. And, and then you have a, a talent development system that says you must have the best kids and we'll give you money to run that system that they then start to recruit at eight-year-old in football academies here in, in England. But I spoke to a very well thought of professional football club academy manager who's been in the game decades, produced tens of thousands of players and like, done so much good stuff. And he said to me, I wouldn't select any kids for our academy until they were 12. Wow. But, the, but the rules say I have to have an under nines, under tens, under elevens in order to draw down funding. So we've just got to start to think about what drives the participation and the performance that we put our kids in those systems. Is it funding? Is it rules? Or is it doing what's right for kids? And if it's doing what's right for kids, then I think we should fundamentally have a think about how we look at our sporting system. Yeah. Can I Jenny, jump in there? Yep. Yeah. Sorry, just because a really, really nice conversation. And what I particularly like about this is we're starting to get into, one, recognising that this is difficult, mm. but two, getting digging into some of the detail here. And I'd like to keep digging into the detail if we can, because when I have conversations with coaches about this idea of streaming, one of the things that I hear back a lot is, but, but we have to stream because the kids who are better right now get frustrated if they get mixed in with some kids who aren't at their level. And those kids who aren't as good get intimidated if they're mixed in with the bigger kids. And so that's not working either. And I'm not saying that's my position. I'm saying that's a, a very common position that I hear back coming from, but we must do this. And I want to really clarify this. Oftentimes from parents and volunteer coaches who are trying to do what's best for the kids and that is their motivation but there's maybe a lack of an understanding behind it so i'd just be really curious to hear if there's anybody in the audience or, or you know anybody listening in who's thinking about some of that how you would maybe respond to that kind of a commentary that comes out i 
Thanks, Phil. Um, I want to tail on there um, to Nick's comment, just in case people are um, not aware, and it isn't um, a plug for the in the book, but um, Amanda Vazek's chapter does talk about this, the top kind of things that Nick has listed there across the, the social element and um, the participation, the enjoyment across boys and girls, because that's tending to to materialize at a you know through there you go phil yeah through the older stages um be, you know beyond the young but we all they're all in it for a jolly actually you know people were tending to say oh the girls are in it to just have a have a, a chat with their friends and be in the bench together and you know play a little bit and the boys are just there to be competitive and i think the reason i thought about that there phil was i wonder why they're not enjoying it i wonder who's putting in their head that you need to do this and you know a plus b equals c i mean i had a conversation with a couple of academy girls who came up to train with the senior team last year and i we we I tend to find as many opportunities as we can off the pitch to connect and one of the sessions that we did together we were talking about why you play football and they came back at the age of young age of 17 to say it's all i know and I thought, how sad, you know, where at home or maybe to the public or the people, they think so all, all encompassed, so driven. And I'm there like inside of me cracking a little bit going, God, mighty, that's really sad. You know, and they they you could feel it in what in the way they said it. You know, uh, I, I can't remember the question. You know, they talked about sacrifices. They Some senior players talked about aspirations and what they'd achieved and blah, blah, blah. And they were like, oh, I do it because it's all I know. And I thought, you know, that that pigeonhole is really scary. Or when people say, I don't like playing with Nick because, you know, he's so good and I never get the ball. Well, what kind of environment have we created then? What's happening in those sessions where I'm not getting the ball? You know, and can I constrain or do I, you know, go off in loads of different ways to be creative, to, to make it more inclusive and do what Nick is talking about and saying, you, you know, you chunk of 10, you played together. But then it's down again, stripping it back to the, the quals, formal and informal learning that those coaches have done to kind of have the confidence to go off piste and say, you know what? your version of success and your measure of development here might be a little bit different to what I'm doing here because, you know, we're just going to have fun and your kid's going to go home and go, oh, I missed that pass tonight. Not like, oh, I didn't make 10 passes tonight. Well, you're seven years old and your, your level of enjoyment tonight for me, your gauge when you get in the car is, you know, depending on what sport it is, but how dirty your uniform is, how many, you know, smiles and not saying that everyone with a smile on their face is having fun, but, you know, those kind of pickups. And I know there's loads of leading people out there talking about parents and that role but I think we as a massive we have a massive role as coaches um, and coach developers to uh, and beyond that sports science team to really hammer home the underpinning theories that that check and challenge some practices. Can I, can I ask you to consider also something that that I see all the time out in the, the, the green outside the house two boys in the, in, in, at home okay nine nine-year-old and a 13-year-old and they have maybe six to eight other friends in the area that they'll play on the green. And there's a goal. There's a couple of goals out there in Swan. And make sure boys and girls from seven to 13, they all play together in games of football. And sometimes it's Gaelic football. And sometimes it's a mishmash of Gaelic football and rugby. And they'll make whatever the game is. It never is a blowout. There's never a team that gets hammered. They all play together. They come up with rules themselves because I can hear them from the, the, the bedroom window and I put an ear out and see is everything OK. They play in a way that creates this incredibly uh, competitive because they are competitive, but they don't need us to be competitive for them. They are doing it because they have created an environment where they have eight, seven to 13 year old boys and girls who will play a game that's close. And if it's not close, what will they do? They'll change something around to make it so that it's still a game. And yet the coaching that I would have done when I started coaching nearly 30 years ago, a little over 30 years ago, was about control and organization. It's got to be through my vision of how the game goes. Yet if I went into that environment, I'd ruin what they had just created. Mm -hmm. well, what are your thoughts on that kind of almost street-like engagement when play players from different you know, backgrounds, levels, uh, different genders, da, 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 play, and yet actually do a really good job of playing together in within their own little world, in matches and games, and seem to get it done really well. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I mean, adults are very good at ruining um, 
sport for kids at times. And, um, and, and those kind of uh, play situations are vital. I mean, that's the playground of school. You know, if one team starts winning by three or four nil, what do they do? They move the kids around and even it up again. Yeah. Um, I had this conversation. I was at, this was a few years back now when I was in my old, in my old role, under thirteen league match in Birmingham. Um, one team turned up with seven players. One team turned up with fourteen players. So the team that turned up with fourteen players said that you play with our three subs to make you have ten, and we'll play eleven versus ten. Awesome! Everybody got to play. Agreed to score for the league, sorted, no problem at all. The league found out. So what did they do to the team that played with seven players? Is they fined them for playing ineligible players. I mean, like, like seriously. Ludicrous. Because the league volunteers have followed the rules that are in place. But they're driven by adult values and not kids' values. So we just have to really think consciously about this. And the fact that you stay indoors, Ed, and watch through the window is the best place for you. <laughs> I um, thought you were going to say something else there. <laughs> don't don't say that the wrong way. But, no, no. But, but, but it is because they work it out themselves. So we have to go back to then to what coaching's about, right? And, and Phil, I thought you made some brilliant points about, you know, the ability bit and kids getting frustrated. So we have to start to refine and think about what success means, as Jenny said as well. Now, Kids teaching other kids is higher order thinking. If you can teach somebody else to do something, then it means that you probably know it pretty well and you have the ability to do that. And also, what is it about? It's about helping other people. It's about showing leadership skills. It's about showing compassion. It's about showing empathy. It's about making the environment more inclusive. And I tell you what, are they not skills we want in future grown-ups in this world? I reckon they are, because I think you'd be a pretty good employee if you show compassion for others. You could coach and mentor other people. You were able to understand someone else's point of view. You're able to bring them into conversation. There's all the way back to the psych safety stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And if we have that and we drive the fact, look, this is about helping other people get better. The score, yeah, look, the score is one indicator. So, yes, they might get frustrated, but let's flip that frustration into how can you help other people get better as well. And sometimes you might focus on the result and say this is about perfect practice. Sometimes you might go, this is all about making as many mistakes as you can. But it's about setting up the environment that focuses on learning and progression based upon process over time, not my ego is driven by just the score at the end of that game. Yeah. And we have to really get past that. But Phil, it's a brilliant point because that's what always comes up. And it's adult values versus young people values that we sometimes get caught in that dichotomy of. So if I may, on those adult values versus kids values, am I right in saying that if we're in an adult values type environment, we're going to hear a lot of adults talking, which I would hear a lot at training sessions for the kids. A huge amount of adults directing traffic, telling them what to do, when to do it and how to do it. And yet, if we actually take a step back, what you'll hear a lot more of is the kids engaging with each other and trying to engage with each other for themselves and with their teammates, as opposed to when the adults are talking and from the sideline, albeit, and sometimes, would you believe, the adults are in the middle of the pitch doing this. Surely that's not that's an adult-driven environment and the kids then will sit, will sit back in the pocket and then the adults will get further thinking, oh, they need me because they're listening to me. Well, no, actually, no, no, they're just being, becoming passive. Yeah, I think there's another thing. We spoke about this after Tokyo in one of our coach convo uh, sessions when the progressive sports came into full swing in Tokyo and we got a chance to see BMX and surfing and skateboarding. And we're not saying that the you know coaching doesn't exist in those spaces, but the camaraderie was really inspiring. You're looking at um, in the in the men's final when his board broke and you know the other waiting for a board to come out and there was this kind of pause moment and everyone was looking on cheering and you know as opposed to young people who are under this insane pressure to aspire to some adults you know uh, vision of what should be or um, but it's there's a lot to be learned about two kids who are you know 14 15 on a surfboard 
and as Nick mentioned there in the different skill set, having the etiquette to know the rules of the water, um, waiting and having patience for the next wave, um, yeah. failing endlessly and and in, inspired by their own failure. Oh, well done. You caught that. I can't believe you caught that. Oh, yeah. You know, all of this and then paddling out against the wave in whatever condition, the responsibility of being in you know deep waters like all of this and that was a trip down to Devon that we saw but you see it regularly and I know they're not that young when we watch them in Tokyo but it's that camaraderie and it's the skill set to still compete and enjoy but navigate um navigate their own space and to understand how to how to read the information the affordances that are there and and be able to react without the constraints of a coach saying you should do it this way I mean again another silly example how many years and how many training sessions I had playing basketball and I went to the first world games at Daegu in Korea and when we played some of the we played Taiwan we played um who else did we play out there? We played Japan actually over the course of five days and the so from a basketball point of view um, we're talking for years about cylinder, be in your cylinder, your feet face a certain way, your elbows tuck in, flick your wrist. So I thought that that's for a long portion of my life. That's how we play. That's how you shoot. That's the best shooters in the world. Only shoot like this. Everyone shoots like this. And then I go to this tournament and I see the Japanese are way beyond the three point line. Chucking up, and that's the norm. Then I see these Taiwanese girls shooting with their feet to the side and they're, the ball starts lower and they're flicking. And I'm I am absolutely blown away. I'm like, how, what, you know, as an adult, I thought, oh my God, how manipulated have I been to think, you know, I can, so it changed my coaching because I've been exposed to those environments, just like maybe if people are watching and picking up on what they're seeing in the playground or pitches or wherever, um, or, you know, on the track, what the kids of that age, when you go to cycling, when I was in some work with British cycling, you have a kid who's 14, who's on a track going 40 kilometers and feeling that something's off with the bike. And he goes to the coach, he pulls over and says, I need to change a wheel. So he takes himself off the track. He goes and get his thousand pounds worth of equipment. He changes it himself, tightens it up and gets back on the track. And there's no hand holding. There's no parent with a wheel and um, there's no, no one else doing the stuff. There's no coach looking over. And it's that kind of those kind of examples um, that you get to a point where the coaches are in a certain space and the athletes are in a and it's magic. So what you're talking about there in terms of that particular example in, you know, a performance sport. So there's a lot of investments going into that young person, but that's something that you can see regardless of the level of ch children, regardless of the level, we see it all the time when they're engaged in play, that what children can do when given an opportunity and when given space and time is extraordinary and how much they can take ownership. And I think a lot of the time in coaching, we see them within these very restricted environments that we've created, these very artificial environments, and we don't give them the time to shine. And it's really important that when we actually take a step back, maybe not just for a session, but for several sessions, to genuinely give them a chance to see what they can do. I think a lot of coaches would be very surprised at just how capable uh, many of them would be. We have a question. Oh, sorry, do you want to come back on that? We've got a question in the chat. Uh, I was just going to say, and how unimportant we are. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think 100%. that's fear, isn't it? It's a sorry, fear. what's your question? So the question actually comes from Finton. So uh, if I can, uh, Finton, if you want to jump on uh, your mic and you can ask it yourself, just in case you have any follow-up. Um, cheers. Thanks, guys. Um, it's just my question was, it was kind of around what you were talking on, but Janet was from Colin Cronin's piece as well and talking about care. And that care doesn't have to be soft. You know, no. care can be challenging. And that was what I was looking at, reframing failure. Like you you know, kids going home in the car with their parents and you don't know what they're being told, like not alone being told maybe on two sides. They can either be told that they were the missed and they were really brilliant and they're fantastic and amazing and the best ever, but that's not helping them. No. How do you reframe the failure or how would you suggest reframing the failure? You can find a question in that somewhere. Well, I think it's brilliant, Fintan. I'm sure Nick will have a load on this. I'll just briefly, I love columns chapter and I follow his work so anyone who isn't hopping on uh, the Cronin bandwagon I would suggest you definitely do that and the chapter is called cruel to be kind um, and it does talk about care and coaching he's done some work UK coaching as well and um, is currently doing some work so he's he's right at the forefront and um, so great reference 
you know what, Fintan, I'm going to strip it back. And I know I have a coach development lens on here, but I do think from all the years I've spent in, in dressing rooms as a player, a coach, performance analyst, mental skills coach, the extensive amount of 25 years of being in a dressing room, how detrimental um, a lack of awareness can be from a coach or a performance support person. And why I'm making that link there is I don't know if people um, say Anna Stoddard does a lot of work around biography. I don't know if people really understand, you know, their own construct to understand how they're seeing things. And I, you know, have conversations with people on a regular basis inside and outside sport where they only see as far as their nose and they'll pick up bits and pieces and they won't understand them fully, but they'll, they'll interpret them their way and won't check and challenge it. So when we look at failure, um, like, I don't know why the ref constraint as well. Sometimes, you know, the words that have a negative kind of association, um, we just don't touch them. And we say over here and it's the fail because success is this and it's only beating others. And it's only, as I've alluded to earlier on, it's only this. And then the parents might believe that and the coach might reference it. And we still do it like I've banged that drum so often this season at West Ham with the women's team. Let's not put the weight of every cross on winning on three points on climbing the table. And we've reduced that. And there's absolutely no direct correlation with us being sixth in the table. But how we're approaching the game, what we're talking about in the dressing room isn't that, you know, what if we fail? Well, it's even if this happens, this is what we look at. So why I come back to that is us as coaches or the role that we have in the sports science team, what is our own experience of failure? Have we had a little dig into that? And do we put it on the agenda, on the table? Um, or are we in this blame culture where we're afraid to make mistakes so no one else can make mistakes and, and the kids or the adults or the recipients of um you know, the, the sporting people who are taking part participants are feeling that off you. And I definitely think, you know, Nick, I don't know what you're thinking about uh, how we would reframe it, but I would think start with yourself and that level of awareness around what you feel about failure, what it looks like in your own environment, what it sounds like. And then you could start to build a new or kind of stretch and challenge the new version of, of uh success. I won't, I was going to say failure. I mean, you know, the use of the word in general. Okay, so so this for me um, circles all the way back to uh, to Ed's starting point about psychological safety, right? So psychological safety for me is um, is a climate in which people are comfortable being themselves. They can share concerns, the mistakes that they make without fear of retribution. They can speak up um, without feeling like they're going to be humiliated, they're going to be blamed, or they're going to be ignored. It is not about an environment that's just about being nice and it's not about lowering performance standards okay so it, it, it's talking in an equal measure it's everybody's contribution being valued and i um i'm married to a sports psychologist which means it's like living with yoda every day um but one of the um one of the best phrases that i've stolen from her is about curiosity before judgment OK, because what we do as coaches, we're really quick to go. I've seen this. I think you should have done this or I think you should have done that as opposed to saying, OK, what did you see? What did you try? And it goes back to reframing that kind of um, success failure thing, really, as intention is greater than the outcome. So what were you trying to do? What option did you see? What option did you see? But you chose not to not to take what options did you rule out in order to go to this one? And they might, it might open all sorts of really cool conversations about, well, they saw the option that you thought they should have taken, but they took a different one because from their position on the pitch, the court, etc., they couldn't make it. Or they didn't think that they could have got the ball there in time. Or I, I saw it, but I didn't take it. Or Maybe when I'm bigger, that one might work, but right now I can't do it. So go back to intention over outcome. And, and for me, the, the outcome of this kind of environment is, is you get a better feeling of belonging. You get people feeling like they fit in somewhere. Um, they're welcomed. Um, it's a safe environment because we don't know what's going on in people's home lives. And for kids and for many young people, Life at home is tough in many, many ways. So this, this could be somewhere that becomes a tribe for them that they fit in with. So how we can then focus on 
um, them as young people. But go back to it's the person first bit. It always goes back to the person first. So like the under eights this week with me at coaching, they always know I'm going to ask them about the highlight of their week. And it's never a judgment. I never judge anything. And these are seven-year-old kids. The first thing I got on Tuesday night at training, what's been the highlight of your week? Uh, Ethan, what's been your highlight? Pooing. Awesome. Everyone needs a great poo, Ethan. What about you, Oscar? And you move on quickly, but that is a seven-year-old's head right there and then. But it's about making them feel safe, that they can say something, that they're not going to be judged for saying it. People have a little bit of laugh, we move on and we go. But we go back to the person first. But then it's about how we set up our environment so that we allow people to experience success in different ways. So if we ask a question to a group, like who are the ones that answer that question? Typically, it's the confident ones. And as coaches, we often go straight to that person because we know that we're going to get the successful answer that we want. But what about the kid that doesn't speak and they're too shy to do it? or that needs a little bit of thinking time. How do you set that up? So I think in my group at the moment, Thomas, Thomas is a bit quieter and he's quite reflective and he needs to think about stuff. So I have to, in my coaching, games going on, and I say to Thomas, Thomas, this is the question I'm going to ask when everybody's together. You've got a few minutes to think about it. Mm -hmm. Then when we all come in, I'm going to ask you for your answer. And I'll have a no hands up rule. So I'll say, right, I'm going to ask a question and I'm going to say, right, you're answering this. And I can then go to Thomas, who doesn't feel dominated by often my son, because he's got too much to say for himself um, or, or another kid that's got, you know, all the answers. But Thomas can then speak without being talked over and everyone will listen to him. And he's had time to think and his comment is valued and he feels success. And whether he has performed well or not is, is, is kind of then irrelevant, but he's had a moment to shine. And I think it's how we set up our environment to facilitate that so that we can help them grow as young people. Like if he gets a bit better at football or soccer, like, like awesome. But, but I want him to be more confident and be better at talking in front of other people and be able to input into conversations and voice an opinion if he disagrees. Like that's, that's the stuff as coaches that should be absolutely at the core of why we do what we do it. Mm. Not the sport bit. We use sport. Jen's heard me bang on about this too much now. We, we use sport as this incredible vehicle to develop young people. And if they happen to get a bit better, awesome. And if they stay physically active forever, brilliant. But this is about developing better people that are going to be citizens of our country and better employees and all of that kind of stuff. Mm. That's ultimately what we're about. And sometimes we get caught up in tech tech and all of that kind of stuff that is largely secondary. Yeah. And if you speak to elite coaches, the biggest difference isn't about the technical tactical. The biggest difference is about relationships, environment, culture and how you work with people. And I'm really sorry, Finton, because we've both absolutely rambled at you with an answer. There. <laughs> but, but in our defence, we did say at the start this was. We did, we did, we did. So uh, if you can put yeah. anything out of that, then amazing. If I can just Brilliant. add, thanks very much. One bit to that, um, as well as is the reality that if we're in a, I mean, again, something we're trying to implement since September um, at West Ham and in previous roles that I've been in that psych safety will promote risk taking. So people can then take the risk and the speed of development will increase. Now I'm not saying again, AB and, and it's very linear, but that's the reality of it. I'll take more risks and I'll have those skills to be able to input at certain times and the confidence will grow. And I'll, uh, you know, if I feel that if I make those uh, judgments or I make those decisions that there's going to be a listening ear and a challenge in the conversation um, and we're not coming around, um, you know, oh, are enabling, we're empowering. And I'd like to make a point here because sometimes when we hear examples like you've given there, Nick, people will say, I wish that's easy with seven year olds. I know from my engagement with you, Nick, that you you do this with adults when we were meeting in that hotel in Birmingham yeah. all those times. That environment of this is a huge project. But you know what? Unless you throw everything at us and some of it's going to be not and some of it is 
we're not going to figure this out. And the environment you created at that time that led to the framework that you guys launched was one of people being in the room saying, um, what, what about this? And some of it was absolutely fell flat in its face. But no one had any sense of, oh, geez, I shouldn't have said that. It was because of the environment you created. And that's with adults and equally with adolescents. If we create that, as you said, that, that a capacity for them to want to try things, that risk sense, let's say, not, not I, want to, I, want, I, I want to make the coach happy. No, it's not about trying to make the coach happy. It's about where I fit in this environment that I'm here with people of my own age. Not, not me trying to appease somebody who's looking on and making a judgment about my ability at this time, or the opposite. If I don't do it well, they're going to tell me what I need to do and when I need to do it and how to do it. Again, as, as kids, and I go to Wayne Smith's yeah. classic phrase about the All Blacks, better people make better All Blacks. As soon as we stop trying to make them All Blacks, we have a better chance of actually getting better <laughs> rugby players out of them. But that's the that's the knock-on effect of actually just trying to make them help them themselves make, become better people. I, I, over this season, I've been working with some semi-pro footballers. Most of them have been in the professional game in some kind of way. Half time for me is the first few minutes we stay out, like let them faff about and you know do whatever they want to do. And then when, when we go in, the first five minutes is tell us what you've what you've experienced. You know what what are you seeing on the pitch? What are you feeling? What are you noticing? And then we'll say, you know, we've we've got a couple of things. You know, here's here's maximum of three things. Because like players can't think more than that anyway, because they're in the heat of the battle. And like no, it's not going to be a 15-minute monologue for me at half time. God no, I can think of anything worse. Um here, like here, here's three things for you as a player to think about. And quite often the players have already said one or two of the things that us as coaching staff were gonna say anyway, so we don't need to say them. We just kind of go cool and we just kind of give them some affirmation. I love that you pick that up as well. That's a, that's a great thing to pick up. What are you going to do to solve it? All right, well, we think we should do this. Awesome. You crack on. We'll talk about it afterwards and see how it went. You know, oh, oh, by the way, here's the one other thing that we want you to think about when you go back out. Like it, it, everyone has their view. It's not my team. It's our team. And when I see coaches, managers talking about my, 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 I, 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 that's bollocks. It's we. we it's we because we are in this together to try and achieve something and make memories as a group of people. That's what it's, it's not. It's not my and it's not about me. And, and, and sometimes whether you're seven or you're working with 27 year olds, we have to start to kind of move away from that ego piece. Ed's already picked up on, on you know, this, the point I want to make, which is when he said, you know, this better people make better all blacks idea. Um, and it's a really core aspect, I think, because, you know, this is this is movement skill acquisition Ireland. And this is about skill acquisition. And what I really like about what you're talking about there is that, you know, the changes that you make to concentrate on developing better people are also the changes that will help you develop skills better. <laughs> it's not different. Yeah. You know, the, the, going back to the myths idea, there are myths about the coach as the someone who is throwing out instruction after instruction, like throwing out a hundred seeds. Actually, what's effective is that one right conversation, planting the seed. And so actually that's where we need to, to get people focused on what's the one key intervention that you want that will, and, and how to do that better. And again, if you get used to doing that, you develop thinking players, and, and you will get the skill acquisition benefit. But actually, these are not two different things. This is, you know, you, you get the same outcomes by focusing on some of the broader developmental aspects, which is really nice. I think we have another uh, question come in from YouTube. I'm going to just pass over to Alan, who's been monitoring those. Yeah, and believe it or not, it is from Oliver Logan who unfortunately couldn't be on here with us, but he's managed to find his way in. Um, and I think it, it comes a lot to some of the conversations you had earlier in terms of from your guys' experience, how much do you see structured training sessions versus free play sessions for kids? And what does that say to you from that aspect of giving kids more free time to just explore and play? 
I mean, are you going to extend the Zoom for another three hours <laughs> as you bring that in? Are you joking me? Um, if, if it was another episode of Coach Convo, but we can keep going, um, we'd talk about the tweet that was linked to, I think, something that you posted, and then there was a trail um, where Will Roberts wrote uh, possibly an extension of the book that the constraints based coaching or game off um, game based approach and means hands off. And he was going to challenge the myth of it. Yeah, I think this goes back to the point I made at the start where the amount. So uh, like, let's just get really basic here. Um, no one's becoming. Well, maybe there's certain pockets in the world a millionaire from a coaching. So there's this empathic desire, this passion, this entry point that comes in. Maybe a kid is playing of yours, maybe a volunteer, and maybe you played, you know, and you get involved for the love of the game or wanting to support people. And then all of a sudden, a a whole heap of responsibilities have come on. So whether you've come out as a graduate and then you're put in the deep end uh, without any experience, or you're coming in as a parent who says, oh, you know what, I'll volunteer an hour. Oh, here's an under 14 team, off you go. And can you do all the admin, wash the kit and do all of this um and then people are coming and critiquing your session and you kind of go oh i'm only googling a few bits and pieces and i'm getting a a few bits off youtube so when i go back to that point i made that will made there this is another term where people thought you know games for understanding or it's not new um or we just play games and uh i'll i'll stand back here it's this it's this phase of a wave of stuff coming in that people are not disseminating and thinking uh you know i'll just run with this and i'm not needed or i am needed and i should impart my knowledge because there's 10 parents looking at me and they'd, they'd be thinking i'm getting paid for this so i should do this or a coach has a certain you know demeanor and should be be doing x y and z so i think whether it's you know a coach role or if you're lucky to have multiple coaches or a wider sports science team it's this uh, collaboration and i know the term um is distasteful in some in some corners whether it's on tap or on top you know this idea that we're, we're going to plan a session who's involved in it where are you getting your information from? Um, you've just had a game. Coaching can be quite lonely as you get further up the pathway and all those pressures are on you. Who's your support network? Um, and actually understanding what's at the core of what you do and why you're doing it and keep coming back to that. So the why did, why did I coach? What, where am I now? Who are these people in front of me? How was their day, as, as Nick said, setting up an environment so that it isn't just throwing a ball down or throwing a hockey stick at a couple of people and saying, off you go. Um, And we'll constrain it with a few cones here. Like how many times have you started a basketball warm up with just doing unopposed layups? Where's the representation? What are you trying to get out of the drills that you're putting in or drills? Look at me mentioning that horrible word. But, you know, by what you're putting in place, why are you why are you doing that? And the terms that you're picking up, the psych safety, these uh, the culture word, my goodness, holy goodness, that's got so much traction. And I hear it in so many pockets and people, I want to create this culture that I read in a book, right? Okay, well, I wouldn't be the person to start that conversation with now. (laughs) My eyes will bleed. Um, So, no, I'm joking. But yeah, I think there's a lot of terms that are going around that people are not fully um, getting to grips with. And it's maybe not having a community of practice, not having an event like this to come to um, and then go back and say, actually, do you know, I picked up a couple of words here now that I'd like to dive into um, or, or having the confidence to go, gosh, I didn't really understand fully. But now I think if I can be the facilitator, that word was mentioned a couple of times, not in a patronizing way, but what is my role as a coach and what is expected of me and how much confidence do I have to kick back when someone says, you know, why are you asking the kids all the questions? Do you not know what you're talking about? You know, and I think that's a key point, because what oftentimes happens, especially for the volunteer parent coaches, is if they don't kind of quite get something, their default is to control even more of the environment, as opposed to I'm not quite sure I get this. Why don't you just take a little just a, a little step back or just take a pause in my speech every so often to maybe capture my thoughts or maybe just to do a little bit of observation or let what's happening on the field unfold. But the panic button is hit. I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm going to now run a, have a running commentary of what's happening. I'm going to tell them what to do constantly. I'm going to come in and fix it. And that's the big thing. I'm going to fix this. And you're thinking, hang on, you're fixing a group of nine-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 12-year-olds. They're not for fixing. Well, I, I saw it. I'm sorry, Nick, I'll let you jump in there. I saw it um, only a few weeks ago. Well, I saw it throughout the season. But, you know, having the privilege to 
to go to all these Super League games week in, week out. And I'm calling it Sabutio coaching. I think Nick said some virtual PlayStation stuff and the same mindset of it. But Sabutio coaching, play short, pass here, go there. I was like, oh, I just wonder what those training sessions look like. Oh, my goodness. It must be we're going to use you in this space. Don't think outside the box. Don't think two steps ahead. I'm not going to ask for clarity on why you did something. You do what I say. And I think, how is this existing in this day and age? You know, how are these people getting paid to do this job? I think it's a good question for Molly. And I think you just have to be clear about what you're trying to achieve and who's it for. So if, if you're doing something structured, who's the structure for? So is the structure for the benefit of the kids? And if so, what are the returns that you get from that practice? So if it is really constrained, you might be getting lots of repetition of a particular technique but are you trading off some of the realism of the game if you're over-structuring it? Or is the structure for the parents so that you show the parents that you think you know what you're talking about? Mm. Because if you do the opposite and it looks chaotic and messy, well, what's the trade-off of that? Well, kids might not get too much repetition about what you're trying to help them get better at. And the parents might think you don't know what you're doing because it's chaotic and messy and you're not in control, even if the kids know what's going on. So it's, it's always this kind of trade-off of stuff. And, you know, Ollie is um, um, certainly one that's got a, a, some very high levels of expertise in terms of understanding this kind of stuff. But it always go back to what you're trying to achieve and why. And then how do you align your um, coaching methods with that? So if you're doing some stuff on um, creativity and divergent thinking and you want the kids to explore finding many solutions, well, then you can't use command style because you're telling the kids what to do and how to do it. And you're at real odds with some level of divergent thinking. And it goes back to all the way kind of, you know, Mostel and Ashworth's teaching methods. You know, this is what we're kind of talking about here. And it's having a really good understanding of the practice design, your coaching interventions, um, what you're trying to achieve with the players, the behaviours that you, you use as a coach. But if you go heavily structured, what you get and what you're not getting. And if you go heavily play, what are you getting and what are you not getting? And then it's the professionalism of the coach to make a value judgment on why you're doing what you're doing. And ultimately, if a coach can say, I'm doing this because of this. Now, I might go and watch a coach work and it's really structured with one kid and it's very repetitive. And I might make a judgment from my position of, as a coach and say, well, it's not realistic. It's a long way from looking what the game looks like, etc." But if the coach then says, oh, yeah, but Jenny's coming back from injury. So she needs a little bit of light introduction and repetition. I'm going to go, cool. You've thought about it. You've understood what Jenny needs. And it goes back to curiosity before judgment, right? You know, I'm really interested about why you've chosen this practice, this style of practice, this method, these questions. Like, I'm really interested to understand that. And if a coach can say, I'm doing it for this, this and this, brilliant. But I think we're still at the stage where where many coaches don't know why they're doing what they're doing. And I, I think the beauty of these kind of webinars, certainly Phil and Ed and all the stuff that you, you talk about, uh, it, this is the kind of stuff that coaches need to really, really see because a coaching qualification from my experiences doesn't give you the stuff that enables you to be a great coach in the main. It might teach you about sport. And it might give you a bit of tech tech stuff, but it isn't going to blow your mind and deal with the problems that you've really got. And just on that, I'm going to be the dampener for the session oh, and have to go. Uh, hey, yes, I know, but somebody has to do it. And normally, come on, Dad. Take the blunt now. Yeah. Um, Let us stay up a little later, Dad. Yeah. Firstly, I would just like to massively thank both yourself, Nick and Jenny, for coming on and sharing that with us. That was absolutely excellent. Um, and obviously, people can find you guys doing that in so many great other topics as coach conversations or coach convos you're on twitter and youtube and everywhere else yeah and uh, we can share your information with that afterwards and we will very quickly just put in that quick <laughs> plug for, we, we've all got <laughs> uh, for, for jenny and amy's book you know when um, jenny said no one's made, no one's a millionaire on the back of coaching yeah. 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 Uh, see this uh, nike t-shirt brand new <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, and just to flag with everybody else, thank you to everybody who came on this evening. Um, and we have our next webinar on the 21st, that is with, with Phil Glasgow, and that is going to be on skill acquisition in physio and rehab. Uh, so keep an eye out on our social media platforms for that. And we will share information on registration and the time on that in the next couple of days. So again, thank you everybody for coming. And Nick and Jenny, if you could just hold on, that would be great. Yeah, thanks. See you guys.